always start off with these interviews just by asking your full name, rank, and serial number. Ooh. Well, the, uh, I know my name. <laughs> That's William John Edhouse. I was born in Awakuni, 16th of June, 1922. And the, wind, uh, the snow was up to the window sills. My dad told me. <laughs> I don't remember it. But they, uh, now that's where I spent my early school days, right till about 18 or 19, I suppose, when I joined the Air Force. And how I joined the Air Force is uh, still a, a bit of a blur in my mind, but uh, my, I think I must have done it through the post office. Everything was done through post office in those days. Uh, now we haven't got post offices. We've got shops on the side of the road that sell a stamp, and you can't get a park to go and get it. So they call it progress. We did have a good system. Getting off the track of it. Yeah. This is so, what happens. Yeah. So, so um, uh, you mentioned earlier something about um, the first time you saw an aeroplane and you skipped school. Oh yeah, well that was during those early school days at Oakuni, the mountain up there is where I was born. If you could see that up there. And uh, there was a, it was called Oakuni Junction. The junction was a, a, a rail line that went from Oakuni to Ratahi. Now Ratahi is, uh, it was designed to be a city. You need a push bike to go across the road. It's so big, it's mighty compared to the, some of those other little country towns. Well, you know, they're very, very narrow streets, but. A rather he's got a wide street for that reason. But um, there's such a thing as you've probably all heard about a bush telegraph and I think it must have worked because I can't understand how we knew as primers. I was in the primers in those days. I think I was only just started school. I hadn't been there very long. Still in the primers. And we knew that there were some aeroplanes out at Macronui, a place called Macronui. Right. And as primers, we got out of school early to go home. Uh, we got out up past two. Everybody else had to stay till three o'clock, sort of thing. You know, in the early days. So right now we a bunch of we coppers. I don't know where they are now, of course, but they all grew up. We all took took off and went down this junction railway line to get to Makaranui to see these aeroplanes instead of going home like we're supposed to. Anyway. To cut a long story short, my mother must have had a fit. It probably was a handful. It was only one occasion where I was a bit of a handful. I just disappeared. And when my dad came home, he knew there was aeroplanes out there too. So how did we know? Because we had no telephone. I don't know me. People just said good day to each other and everybody knew what was happening. It was a bush telegraph operating. Somebody knew something that was gossip straight away. Everybody knew. But we knew too, so. And anyway, my dad came home and pacified my mother. They had all the other brothers there, all hunting around looking for me. Where's Bill? He should have left school. He should have been home by now. Where's he got to? Fall, falling in the drain somewhere. That's what her worries were. We had to cross the river to get home, of course, and that was another worry. He'd fallen in the river, fallen in the creek, got hurt. Terrible time. But in the meantime, I was leaning on a fence, gazing in awe and wonder at these flying cars. They taxied out from under the trees and they zoomed up into the sky and back again. That, and I was really taken with it. When it came dark, I was still there. And my dad and my mother and my brothers all came. They, he'd, they plonked everybody in the old Model A. We had an old tin Lizzie in those days. He plonked them all in there. He said, I don't worry about there. About to hand it to the aeroplane. So I don't. They found me. <laughs> Watch all of these aeroplanes. Get home. Get home. Go on. Where are you going? You're supposed to be home. Why didn't you? Anyway, uh, that was my first introduction to aeroplanes. And when you applied for the Air Force, did you want to be a pilot? Well, in those days you just joined. It depended on what they needed more than anything. You could ask to be a pilot, and of course I couldn't even drive a car, but I told them I could. I had knowledge of driving a car. <laughs> Dad wouldn't let us drive his car. 
no show. <laughs> we might smash it. <laughs> so anyway, one thing led to another. But I knew how it was done. How I got through it. So it's mentioned in one of those interviews I did with an American chap, how they decided I was suitable material for a, uh, to be in the Air Force. So that's how I got in. But I must have joined it through the Air Force, uh, through the post office because there's no other way that I could think of. I had no ambition, there was no ambition. All I knew were two brothers had joined the army and from what they told me, I didn't want to be a foot flogger. I was ten years old before I even saw the sea, so I didn't know enough about the sea. I knew about rivers and lakes and things like that, and ponds and so on, catching fish and eels and trout, but nothing to do with the sea. So I thought, oh, I'll try the Air Force. <laughs> that was, but well, I beg your pardon about the, my introduction to, the, to an Air Force, wasn't it was Captain what's his name? Well, Kingsford Smith. Kingsford Smith. I remember quite clearly the day that he flew over from the from Australia to New Zealand. And I was only about a five or six year old, I think I'd be about six. We'd been out the back of Goldie's farm catching these little frawly crayfish, you know, Kura, I think it's a Maori name for fresh freshwater crayfish. And I couldn't keep up with my two brothers, they were a bit faster than me, and I flaked out on this wooden bridge and the tram line, the wooden tram line to take the logs and things to the sawmills. And I flaked out, and I heard this noise in the sky, and I looked up, and there's a whacking great big bird flying over an engine. <laughs> it was Kingsford Smith. I've never forgotten that. I immediately started peeling one with a pocket knife to try and make a little arrow and <laughs> stick it on a stick. <laughs> so that was my introduction to Air Force thinking. And I don't regret it over the years. Uh, I soon got interested in it when we did join and got with it. I couldn't stand the drill part though. It was a bit of a, bit of a nuisance. Where, where did you do that first training? Was it? Uh, it was at Rotorua. But to get there, to be accepted, there was a big deal. When I got that telegram, to, uh, that I, my application to, to join the Air Force has been considered and I had a direction, a directive, I think they called it, some <laughs> big word, to report at 0900, no, 0915 hours at Tikawiti on a certain date, I can't remember the date, so I had to ask me, Dad, what's this 0915 hours? Is that a code? I thought it was a code, you know, because in those early days of the war days, there was all sorts of advertising. Is your journey necessary? Uh, don't lose talk, and this type of thing. No loose talk. You weren't allowed to do this, that, and the other thing. And I thought it was something to do with a code to re report to Tika Whitty. Now, Tika Whitty was, you know, King Country township like Mananui was there in those days where they shifted down from Awakuni down to Mananui. And uh, to get to Tikawiti, I had to catch a train at half past seven and uh, half past two in the morning to get 67 miles away. So, and we already lived about four and a half mile away from the station. So I hops on this bike, and we only had a family bike, I don't know who owned it, well, Dad owned it I suppose, it was a hand-me-down thing, it was full to bits. I hopped on this bike to catch this train and pedal away there and the fog was pretty thick, usually a big fog goes in the King Country up those that time of the year. And I got down to what they called the Matapuna Bridge, and the Matapuna Bridge is a combined rail and traffic bridge with a water, or a porter, or water I suppose you'd call him, a gatekeeper into that. He had to open and shut the gate whenever the train went through. And Lord, any help anybody that bro broke his law to get in. So I got to this gate and it was closed. And I heard a train toot. I said, Strike, I'll catch that train. So I picked the bike up, threw it over the top of the gate, climbed over the side, pedaled my way across the other side. And fair dink, and this gatekeeper, he wouldn't let me through the other end. <laughs> he was going to have me arrested. <laughs> on the spot, 
and I had to show him all the gear, all the details. I tried to explain to him what I was on His Majesty's service. <laughs> this big letter that said, on His Majesty's service. And that's what I'm on. I said, I'm going to join the Air Force. I said, how do I know that? So he looked at it, he got his little lantern out and so he peered at it closely. And then he relented then. And let, but he looked, before he let open that gate, he looked upwards and downwards to make sure nobody was watching him. Because I'd, I'd already broken the law and he was aiding and abetting me those days. That was a typical public servant attitude. The gates were to be shut five minutes before and five minutes after sort of thing. But he let me through and I paddled away down there and I get a bit further down and I heard the train toot again and I stood up on the pedals. Bang! Chain came off. Well, drive a bit of mess. So I got off this bike, chucked it over the hedge, I said, hang it, I can't fix it up. So I started to walk and then a car, I saw lights coming towards me. I got out, waved it down. Now this is the part that uh, I haven't told the family very much about. How did you go to war, Dad? <laughs> well, believe me or not, I went. I was in the dung before I got started. <laughs> I waved the vehicle down, and it wasn't until it stopped to realise what it was. <laughs> it was the night cart. <laughs> so I went to war. Went to war in the night cart. He got me to the railway station to catch this train. It was, it was all right once we started moving, but by oh, the powers, fairly. Anyway, that's, that's how I became suitable material for the Air Force. Got to Tikawiti eventually in the train. It was, it was 0915 hours, and I got there at about, oh, it must have been 6 or 7 o'clock, and hung about there, and the fog was thick enough to cut off. You need a knife and a fork to get through it. There, Duncan. But at any rate, it so happened that at 0915 hours, I was the only one at the address given to me. Eventually, somebody turned up. He was part of the committee that was interviewed, but he didn't have the key. <laughs> Nobody. There was three, three coming to, to attend to do, put me through the paces and see if I was suitable. Eventually we got got into the building, it was a stone cold, he got, somebody went home or got hold of somebody that did have a key, so we got the place open and got set to. It was all over in about 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's how I finished up uh, reporting forthwith. <laughs> okay. That's how I joined the Air Force, I joined it in, way out in the King Country, nobody knew any different. No. Well, can we um, jump forward a bit now to when you just got onto the Hawker Hines? Oh yeah, from there, well, from there it was a simple matter. Uh, I joined the Air Force. I had to do a pre-entry course. That's right. That's the pre-entry course stuff. And that fair day, by the time you've done through that, you're, you're, you're equivalent to a university entrance. It was matriculation and standard. But I did that in uh, spare time. <laughs> And eventually got to our uh, uh, Well, we, yeah, we went to. We had to go to um, One Tree Hill in Auckland on a, a preliminary. I don't know what they called it, but there was. Uh, they had to wait your turn to be called in to the Air Force days, but they still had to put you through your pace of a bit of military training. And we did our training on uh, One Tree Hill. And marching here and marching there, and we went out on big name manoeuvres. And that manoeuvres day, we had to cart all your gear, rifle, bedding, and tent, and everything you owned. There was nothing left behind. We took off. We got in the trucks. They took us out in a truck and dumped us out on this farm, away out the back of Auckland somewhere. And uh, that was part of our manoeuvre. Our job was to penetrate the and an imaginary enemy force that was holding a hill over there. We had to capture that hill and keep out of sight. It was, it was occupied. So one of the other teams was selected to stop us. You know, see, that's, it was pros and cons. And you had to be able to sneak up on this hill without being seen. Well, they call that manoeuvres. Well, to me it was a simple matter because in the King Country, 
We'd snuck up on rabbits and hares and deer stalking, pig hunting, all caught trout and fish, and tickled the trout too without a hook or any damn thing. In other words, we knew how to, to treat nature naturally. Part of it, we became part of nature to capture this hill. And my, the platoon that I was in listened to me eventually. I said, no, you're not going to, no, no, get your head down, get your head down, get down, 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 get the shade down, get on the leaf. You know, we'd, we managed to capture the place and be back again well ahead of time. Anyway, on the way back, we did the do this manoeuvre, we camped the night or some damn thing, I've forgotten now. But on the way back from that manoeuvre, the trucks never came to pick us up. We had to walk back, cart all this stuff back. Well. Got as far as, I think it was Green Lane or some area out that way, somewhere, the tram line. I didn't know Auckland at all in those days. But I saw all these people waiting on the side of the footpath there for it and the tram lines. And the tram come chucking along and they all got on. I nudged the chap next to me and said, Are you on? He said, What do you mean? I said, Get the ride. <laughs> we, we, we snuck in behind the crowd. I then went to the guard at the, tra at the tram. I said, we've got to get back to get the tea on. Because <laughs> we're all tramping back to, to, to Green Lane or Green, what do you call it? Well, that's that place we stay. Uh, I forgot what the park was, some park on Mount Eden. Uh, it'll come to me shortly, what the name of it was. Um, was it Cornwall Park? Corn Cornwall, yeah, Cornwall Park. But that wasn't the name they gave us, Cornwall. It was Cornwall Park. Uh, it'll come shortly. Funny name. But in that Cornwall Park was that had a big stone wall around it. Yeah, because I hid my shoes behind there. For my boots, <laughs> big boots, and put my shoes on. And went to town. <laughs> Played the wag. But anyway, we got a. We jumped the tram. The tram, the tram said, so "Put your gear in the corner there." And uh, so we did that. Bent. You kept bend down till we went right past this big column of. <laughs> just slugging away, counting all their gear, marching back. Get back to um, to the park entrance. And they let, he let us off as close as he could. He couldn't get right to it. He said he gave us the instruction how to get there. One day, a couple of hundred yards up the road, and find the gateway. Got to the gate, and of course the guard wanted to know what the hell. Well, we have to have said, oh, we've been sent here to get the tea on. Oh, we better get cracking in here. got so on, so we shut up there. Had a good hot shower. I mean. <laughs> Cooks had already got the tea ready. So, so that's... But anyway, do you remember the... Who was the chap that um, lost his copy book and said, called him Gentleman of the Air Force? Oh, um, I've heard... Sir, Sir O'Neill, wasn't it? I think, I, I think General, you're right. I think yeah. you're right. Anyway, he... Uh, he came to visit this bunch of blo ex Air Force, or budding Air Force type, we weren't, we weren't ex, we were budding types, so waiting for to get into the Air Force intake. And uh, somehow or other, he must have heard about uh, those sort of guys they wanted, they wanted so they could think. So <laughs> I finished up, I only heard about five or six weeks at the big and one, one tree hill, and I was on my way to, to Rotorua. I got to Rotorua, it was called the ITW, which is uh, the initial training wing. Now, I hadn't been to Rotorua before, but the pong and the stink and the smell was bad enough. We stayed out. We were domiciled at a place that uh, one of the hotels had been taken over. I think Brent's Hotel was the headquarters for the main body of Air Force trainees. But the sleeping quarters, we took out, they took over anybody that had accommodation and we were staying, a bunch of us, about half a dozen I suppose, domiciled at a place called Hinemoa, Hinemoa House I think they called it. It was just an ordinary boarding house with a two-storied balcony and one thing or another. Nothing flash, meals were all right, but what irked me more than anything we had a keep polishing all these buttons all the time. Polish the buttons and you know so they got them polished and the big and sulfur sulfur in the air and tarnished them again and you got growled at. <laughs> the discipline on that side of it didn't appeal to me in the least. I, I didn't mind ordinary discipline to train you to do anything but senseless stuff, senseless. It had meant nothing and it was common sense that you're wasting your time. 
to me, I thought it was just stupidity. And here we were polishing brass buttons and as soon as we got outside they'd be finished. Stupid. Uh, but anyway, we had to put up with it, we had to do it. Tramped all around Rotorua for about three months. I don't know it was three weeks or three months now, I'd have to look at it. Well, I didn't keep a diary really, we didn't get log books until we got the flying days. So I don't know how long we were really at Rotorua, it wasn't that long. It was cold and miserable and frost, tramp. The best part was when we knocked off, we'd be on our swim. <laughs> <laughs> cost us nothing. <laughs> uh, and then, now to get from there, got sent to Re Remuera, posted overseas. We were, had done, we'd done all our homework, passed out our certificates, or passed out suitable, we did training for Morse code and signals and all that type of thing, and the theory of flight, the theory of this and the theory of that, navigation, did a lot of that. It was high-powered stuff, and I don't know whether I could do it today, but I suppose I'd get there. Uh, somehow, <laughs> today they could press a button and they'd take the answer. We didn't. We had to figure out the answer. It was a different, different way of teaching people to do things. And I don't regret it. I don't regret it a single bit. Uh, now, to get to the Air Force flying days, from that point onwards, my life turned upside down. We were given 10 days final leave. All our pay books had been changed to dollars and cents, American dollars, Canadian. We knew all our Canadian coinage. Hadn't used it, but we were supposed to know it. <laughs> uh, didn't have a penny left of New Zealand funds. <laughs> had this 10 days leave and all the locals gave me farewells and send-offs and presentations. The family gave me a fountain pen, somebody gave me a wallet and nothing in it. <laughs> and I've still got those sort of things. The pen, I think, disappeared in the years as the family took over. <laughs> Bits and beat, oh, I want that, okay, I let them have it. I never, never got it back. Doesn't matter, I didn't want it. And, um, uh, yeah, then I got a telegram and it was a bit strange, the wording. In those early days, it was sort of a hush-hush climate in the community. Idle talk was dangerous. Uh, is your journey necessary? You don't do this and you don't do that. Everything had to have some uh, oh, sort of value given to it, whether it was for the good of the country, you know, the, we were at war and we didn't know it, we had no gear. It seemed a silly war, really. And if to go to war, we had to go overseas to do it. Uh, it wasn't New Zealand war at all, it was a, England, where England went, we went, or some jolly thing, words to that effect. And we were only young fellows, just virtually straight from school, we didn't know any different. We did as we were told. So when I get this telegram, to report forthwith, a word I'd never heard of in my life. I was, what the hell is this fourth whistle? That's my dad. You'd have to ask the post office. So there again, the, uh, what's this fourth with caper? I said, what would happen if I went without? And nobody could answer that one. So anyway, I, with my fourth, I went. And, and I got to Arakia. And uh, from then on, my life just changed altogether. And, uh, we were budding youth and they gave us a, a funny little, they call it a forage hat, I think they call it, that as budding air crew, we had to wear this little white strip of flash in the, in the set into one of the seams of the cap, the forage cap, to indicate that we were, I don't know whether we were special people or not, but I don't know, we were in a special training. But anyway, we. We knew which, whose hat it was, you didn't get mixed up. <laughs> That's about the good of that. But we spent oh, about three months, I suppose, at Ohaka. But I remember now that Ohaka was being, still being built. There was concrete trucks tearing up and down, there was shingle, and they had a great big quarry set up by the bridge there, by the, the Bull's Bridge. The Bull's Bridge had been built had been built, but I think they must have built the quarry for that purpose. And 
they built all the concrete runways at Haki and the, and the hangars. There's a lot of concreting being done there from the Rangitika River. It was a, a busy place and uh, we did a lot of theory at Ahakia, but we were uh, transferred from there by truck. They called it a bus. It was a truck with a couple of wooden saw stools in it and a canvas top over the back of it. A three-ton three truck took us into a place called Milson and that's where the Palmerston North Airfield is now. And it was a farm in those days, a big farm. We were to do our tra flying training there rather than at uh, Ohakia because of the congestion. Uh, some of the pilots, they were still being trained too. I was trained as a, as a wireless operator air gunner at that stage. And some of the pilots, they were still learning their job, same as us. <laughs> but we survived. My first introduction to that place at Milson was when we arrived and somebody lifted up the corner, we turned the corner off the main drag and went into the farm gates. Here's this uh, aeroplane upside down, or nose down, into the mud, up against a fence. And we'd heard later that uh, the ground was so soft that uh, you had to do a ground loop or put on all the brakes to stop and she nosed over. And he buried his nose in the ground. There was a chap called Pat Malloy. I actually flew with him later on. I was just looking at my log book just now and I said his name's even mentioned quite often. So it probably didn't deter me altogether from going to the Air Force. What's a, what's a brain or two? <laughs> but uh, I'd had a few knockbacks over the years. I'd fallen off horses, fallen off trees, fallen off a waterfall, and <laughs> jumped off cliffs and all sorts of funny things like that and still came up. So, Accidents never entered my mind, you know, they just didn't. There was no danger. I, I didn't have any danger of going in the air. You know, I'd seen Kingsford Smith fly, well, if he can do it, I can do it, sort of, that attitude. <laughs> and your first flight would have been in a hind then, would it? Yeah, yeah it was. It was first, yeah, the very first flight it was in a hind. Uh, I've got my log book here. And, uh, what have I got here? Where the hang is it? No, I haven't got I haven't got my Hawker, early Hawker Hind stuff in here. Um, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Sorry about that. It's a, it's an, I went in an Oxford. Now my very first flight was in an Oxford 258 by a pilot officer, Glanville to do some splash grouping. So we must have shot off in a blink in Oxford to fire a few rounds to get the feel of a gun. Yep. And that was on the 7th of September 1942. But from there on things did change. We did a bit of this. And my first flight in a Hawker Hind. Oh, Davy Rowcliffe. 1330 hours. Hawker Hind 1548 was the number. Flying Officer Rocher. Now I got to know that chap so well that he was one of my, I would say without doubt, one of the three best pilots I ever flew with right throughout the war years. Davy Rocher just bluntly could fly those Hawker Hines like a white butterfly. Now if you look at a white butterfly, it doesn't stay straight and level. It's always ducking and diving all over the sky. I would say Davy would have survived any dogfight because I went in several dogfight trainings with him from that point onwards. But I, very, I had to realise that Davy was the first one in a hall behind for me. And I had a lot of respect for him for, for years later. He came against him all after Wonga Ray, years later. And we threw him up there. <laughs> Small world, doesn't matter. Okay, I'm sorry I interrupted. That's, that's right. Um, and so you were doing air gunnery practice and that sort of thing. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you see, a hawker, New Zealand wasn't ready for war. We had no gear. The Hawker Hines that we flew, I've looked into the history of them, and as far as I can understand, they came from uh, India. They'd been flying up and down the Khyber Pass. 
Well, Afghanistan, Donnybrook's going on now. That Donnybrook was still going on away back in 1936-37. These hawk lions are tearing up and down there trying to control things. How stupid can you get? The world's crazy. They control war. They won't fix anything with the war. But what they're doing over there now is no different except that they don't ride camels. <laughs> yeah, however, that's somebody else's problem. Or is it? I don't know. I've spoken to young fellas today. Be careful if you're going to go to Afghanistan, what are you going to go there for? Right. Whose war is it? You look after New Zealand. That's your job. It's your job. You're the interviewer. <laughs> you look after this country. That's what we've heard. So I've got off the track again. Yeah, yeah. How, how long were you at Milson for before oh, you? Oh, not very long. Not very long. Long enough to qualify to be suitable. And then there was three of us. Four. Four of us. No, hold on. Out of that, I mentioned about the four, 14 of us got that telegram to go with, forthwith to the hack. It was 14 of us out of that bunch, out of about, say, 150 odd people going to Canada. There's 14 of us who were selected to stay behind and get cracking. And when you look back on those days now, why? My summing up was that, from this is in hindsight, of course, now. I didn't know anything in those early days, we just did as we were told. But when you look back into those years now, I think that the authorities of the day, New Zealand authorities of the day, were told by the Americans that America couldn't do any more for us either. And New Zealand would have to pull its finger out and do a bit more to look after itself. It took too long to send chaps like myself and their mates over to Canada to be trained and then we'll bring them back again. They need somebody now. We'll supply the plane. We'll supply this, that and the other. And they did too. So that's how I put it together now those days. Why? That's what happened. But we did our thing and then from Milson, once we qualified, we were suitable to do the job that was needed. Three of us, it was Jock Leaf, he came from Hokianga, Chuck. Chuck and I became pretty good mates. Chuck was a Maori by tradition or trade. We were, that was his nationality, really. His father was a, a captain or a major. I'm not sure which, what his top rank was, but he was uh, well up in the Maori battalion. And he got killed overseas somewhere. And Chuck got railroaded home in the middle of the... the, the campaign up in Solomon. It's Jock and I and Bert Douglas, the three of us, were sent from Milton up to Wangarei to start up a squadron up there. Uh, new pilots came. Some of the pilots we'd flown with Milton too were sent there too. We are all young fellows. <laughs> we set up, it was about four of us, seven or eight pilots I suppose, and seven gunners to set up this squadron. And our job there was to uh, well, look after New Zealand's interest in because there was definitely a threat that New Zealand could be invaded to. The so Japan was rampart, it was rampant. Singapore fell over. Well, we're looking, we've had the guns pointed out to sea and the jets come in behind them. What the matter with them? Wake your ideas up a bit. They did it. it was an unnatural type of warfare. And uh, well, MacArthur got sent to, out of Philippines, he went to Aussie. Darwin got bombed, so it was a different world. The war was, wasn't going well for New Zealand anyway, or anybody really. We were on a, a bad streak. That's how it all came about, that uh, we had to look after New Zealand first. And all we had was these hawk islands, I think, as I said, they came from uh, from up and down the, the, the RAF had had them up on uh, Kyber Pass and with the new new planes in England. Of course, they'd keep them there, and we'd get all the stuff that was left over. Uh, Vickers Vincents and the wildebeests and two wing, double wing things, you know. Uh, to, to, today they look obsolete and out of date, and they probably are. But my word, they were they were aeroplanes. They did what they had to do. That. Hawker Hind was so 
versatile for its day. You could outmaneuver kitty hawks. Kitty hawks were, we did, we did, we did kitty hawks were from Ardmore. They were trained at Ardmore, and before they went up to the Pacific, they had to uh, do an exercise and capture Dargaval, for instance. Our job was to stop them. And so we'd be stooging around up in the sky, eight and a half, ten thousand feet, hiding in hide and seek in the clouds, waiting for these kitty hawks to come past. <laughs> All done with camera guns, it was all camera gunning. And uh, we never got shot down. We were too manoeuvrable. We could turn inside a kitty hook, no to Kitty hook come diving out of the sky at you. He's, all you do is dodge him, you get take four miles to turn around and come back. So, Did you ever shoot any kitty hooks down with the camera gun? Oh yeah, I got my quota, <laughs> you might call it, I suppose. Uh, but it was, it was the only way we could learn, and the only way they could, the pilots could learn too, don't forget, you know. It was a bit like cowboys and Indians, that type of thing, but uh, with a more serious effect. And you were, you were marked on it, you know, you were graded, I suppose as you called it, whether you're good or bad, or whether you could shoot straight or not. And the camera, as the elders say, the camera doesn't lie, but... Uh, I think sometimes it did. <laughs> but the drogue shooting, there was another one too. If we get back onto this part of the training side of it, we did that up there at Wilbury too, because we didn't have a lot of training in uh, guns and things, the actual firing. We did a lot out in the ocean, a lot of it. Uh, talking about the drogue and the Vickers Vincent's. The Vickers Vincent was a huge biplane, bigger than the Hawker Hine, big clumsy looking thing. But I think the Hawker Hine would be more versatile, it was a bit smaller, but faster, did the job. We could carry bombs. And one of my training days, we um, had to do a bit of drogue shooting, and they told me the pilot's name was. McKay. Now this is a story, this is a side type, side type, type. years later, I'm, I was lucky to draw, draw a marble to get the Solomons there on that uh, goodwill tour that Mrs. Clark shouted us. It was a long way to go to turn round, but we did it, went up there, turned round and came home. But on the, well, in Wellington, a big ceremony took place, they were a big march past and all this sort of thing, and they took us for a big tour through the city. We all climbed on the army trucks and vehicles, right? I clambered up onto this whacking great big monstrosity of a vehicle. Found myself a seat, sitting alongside a chap. He nudged his mate aside, pushed him along a bit more, gave him out of that room, we introduced each other. And uh, I said, what were you doing during the day? He said, oh, I was in Corsairs. He's a great big, he's bigger than you, big fella. He wasn't in the early days, but he's got big over the years. And, uh, I thought he was a bit big for, for a course here, but he wasn't. And then he, had, uh, he gave me his name, McCabe. He said, I said, I remember McCabe. But I said, he flew um, Vickers Vincent's. He said, that was me. He said, we drove. That was my, and his mate was alongside him. There's two of them that used to do these, to go around all the different places towing these droves for us to shoot at. So I said to him, I said, you actually survived. <laughs> he could have got shot down even before he could have left the country. <laughs> it was up in the, the Corsairs, because I knew a lot of the Corsair boys too, you see. <laughs> That's a little sideline. We're sitting in a truck, we meet each other about oh, 60, 70 years later. <laughs> Small world, you know. You never, you know I, could, I could write a book about some of the names that crop up and the crossover. You know. Getting back to what we did at, in the Hawker Hines at Onirahi, it was Onirahi actually. It was, it was only a farm again that had been taken over by the so, pub. Sorry, say that again. Hmm? What was that? Sorry, say that again. The property was a farm taken over by the Public Works under the Public Works Act. So they shifted the houses and made, it, made an extra. It was a grass paddock, there was no tar seal. No such thing as Tar Seal. Uh, our huts were just little sheds underneath the pine trees, uh, way down off the field, too. We had to walk to work. 
up the hill a bit. Not much, not far, but we had a young fellas we could be up there in a couple of minutes. <laughs> and uh, there was an occasion there, uh, a little bit of realism, even though we were like, well, the work we were doing was like being in a flying home guard, really. It wasn't dangerous in the sense that the enemy's going to pop up and shoot you down. There was none of that. There was no likelihood of that. Don't be say it couldn't happen. I'm not going to believe in Murphy's Law. If it's possible, it will. And uh, anyway, it, uh, it so happened. I got woken up one morning, early in the morning. It was still dark. Got woken up. Oh, aren't you? It was Davy Rowcliffe. This chip, Davy Rowcliffe, wanted me to get him. He's going to, he's going to. There'd been a report of a strange ship up off Cape Brett, I think it was. Cape Brett or the hen and chickens up in that area. And uh, we, we were to go out there and locate it. So we got out there, the mechanics were all on. We've been woken up, we got the old aeroplane out for us, everything gassed up, the whole thing. And I looked and she, it seemed to be drooping. There's 250 pound bombs on each side. So we took off of these 250 pound bombs, it was lumbered into the sky, took off away to blazes out over the ocean, up and down, getting low on gas when we came back, we couldn't find it. Just as well, too. But I was all that. I can remember as clear as anything, if we drop one of those bombs, the other one's going to flip us over. And I was a bit concerned. <laughs> I'm sitting in the back, I hope no Davy would know what to do. <laughs> He's the pilot, I'm just sitting there <laughs> with my little gun. <laughs> I don't know how they voyage, you'd take two extra pans of... In those days, our ammunition was in pans, a circular drum for a Lewis gun. He said, bring a couple of extra pans with you, because in case you need them. I said, this is for real. So, okay, I've got these extra pans of food. There was nowhere to put them, I'd laid them on the floor. <laughs> so um, I had them. But um, when we came back, the wind had changed and we had to land on the short runway. Now, coming in with a load, still loaded up with these bombs, uh, we landed on the short runway and she wasn't going to stop. We just kept trundling, 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 you know, the extra weight and extra speed because you had to fly over the fast a little bit, or revs and so on, to land it with the load on. We were heading for the town hall. Now, the town hall, when they built this airfield, they just fenced off part of the township. It was only a little village. And the town hall was part of our, uh, well, assembly hall, I suppose you could call it, if a, if a station was required to assemble in one place on a wet day, it would be in the hall. And that was it. <laughs> we were heading there to blow the thing up. <laughs> but anyway, old well, Davy, you know, he stood up on this thing and reminded me of that upended hawk behind it, Milson. Same thing. It was a dread. I don't know why. It was always a fear that the damn things could nose over. And he gets up on one leg and he puts one, and we did a wheelie. Jam the brakes on one wheel, and she spun around with a wingtip, dipped, and we ploughed a big 360 degree circle in the, in the turf. Right then, survived. <laughs> so that's a little bit of the realism of the war side of it. Do, do, do you remember other um, accidents there? I know Tim Murray had a bad one on his Tim, first flight. Tim crashed at night, coming in a night night flying. We did a lot of night flying. Uh, that was the, no, the worst one was when, and Murray Gray, I think Murray Gray was the one that pranged with Tim. It was, yeah, now I come to think of it. Yeah, Murray and Tim pranged on the end of the runway, coming in over at night. Now, I don't know how long afterward, but there was a, a bomber's bond campaign by Bombers Bond and Murray Gray and Lucky Smith. Lucky Smith came back from the Middle East for, on, on uh, oh, I don't know whether it was time leave or what, but something, I think it was bad health or something. It was two of them, Murray, Jeff Moore and Murray and uh, Lucky Smith came back. Now, Murray Gray took off in this tiger moth. They flew up and down the main street of Wangarei, 
did a split ass turn at the top and came back again. Now, a tiger moth, a petrel, is in the top wing and it's gravity fed. The fact that he flew up and flipped upside down, no petrel could get to the engine. She, cut, she lost revs, see. His engine cut out on him because there was no feed. Upside down, <laughs> didn't do the flip. Well, I had to do a flip round it sideways, but to flip over, that's what happened there, and it, you went straight into the concrete wall and killed both of them. Now, I had to look after the uh, funeral arrangements on that. I was the sergeant on the funeral for it because we both belonged to the same church type of thing. And uh, I remember that as clear as anything. I, I hate drill and I hate being a showpiece. I, to me, it was as bad as the accident to be, to be involved in that side of it, you know. So you ask me a sort of a question which brings back sad memories, but there were bad times. And it, the day it happened, the day that they happened, in, we, were, we weren't in, on flying duties at all. The siren went, that's right. And in those days it was a ritual if anybody had a praying, you immediately got airborne. The whole squadron, but of what they were doing, where they were on leave or anything, if they heard that siren, back and get to the end. We're all in the air again in about five minutes, you know. The planes taken off all over the place. So we got airborne. And, and I think it's a, it's a custom from England. Fighter boys over there had it. They, they, they would... So they wouldn't lose their nerve, I think, was mainly the reason for it. I'm still one of those blokes that look for reasons why, you know. That was, to my way of summing it up, it's mainly they don't lose their, their nerve. But I can remember that being scrambled up in the air smartly. Oh, another time, it was a dangerous time, and I flew with a chip call. I better not give his name, he got killed later on. and He should never have been a pilot. Full stop. Full stop. Poor old Davy. Let's call him Davy. It wasn't Davy Rowcliffe at all, not Davy. And uh, he was one of those pilots who was conscience driven, I suppose, to do his bit and be good at it. Uh, he'd read a book or read the book. What does the book say? He didn't. He wasn't flying with a seat of your pants, in other words, you're not natural. It wasn't a natural fly. The other pilots looked like a fly anywhere with them. If they were good, they were. They flew by instinct, but not Davy. Davy would have to puzzle it all out. How to do this. At any rate, we were doing formation flying. Landing in formation, taking off in formation. Why? I don't know. I didn't see any sense in it personally, but that was part of the training, was to train the pilots, I suppose. And then anyway, we took off and we're coming into land, fair dinkum, we nearly landed on top of the flight commander. He was in charge, like, coming in threes, flight commander first and you one on each side. And instead of Davy throttling back, we're coming in, he, he gives a rev up and we shoot in front of them. Next thing, nearly got landed on him. Mick Hunter was the flight commander. Boy, did he give her the gun. He ripped up, zoom in, got his wingtip under ours. He could fly like a butterfly, as I see, like, like Davy could too. He put the wingtip and forced us back up into the sky. And he gave, he gave, he gave poor old Davy a lesson on how to fly a hawk eye. And I just calmly got my parachute, hooked it on my harness up one of those observer. Uh, observer suits and you hook them on your chest. And I just sat down and I said, oh, no, if we're going to do silly buggers like this, I'll be going over the side. <laughs> if you're gonna, you know, he could have easy praying to solve it. He was in that sort of a mood. I'm Mick Hunter was no mess, he didn't mess around with him. But, gee, you know. but uh, that was a dangerous one or two. Two dangerous ones there. The other one was with this other Dave again. It's two Dave. I thought of the Dave, shouldn't have been a pilot. We're away up 90 mile beach area, way up past Dargo, past the Hokianga, way to blazes up there. And the northerly mist came in. You get a northerly sea, or near the northerly comes in off the sea, 
and it closed in. And uh, Davy starts to head inland. See, he was going to get. I know what he was going to do. He was going to get onto the onto the railway line and follow the railway line home. Wow! I know what that country can like up there, and you've got to be down low to do that. You got to try if you can see it, but in a mist. Once you got into that mist, it was a finish. We, 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 we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have gone home that night. I tapped him on my shoulder. He couldn't, no, we had no voice contact in those hawker hides. You had to shout at each other or pass him a note. And I yelled out in his ear, leaned over, and shouted. He couldn't quite hear what I was getting at, so I wrote it down. Follow the surf line. Follow surf line. Follow the surf line down the Cape. And that's who eventually did that before we came back. And we wouldn't have made it that day. It was bad news, you know. You asked me about those sort of, sort of dangers. Uh, those are the things that stick in my mind. But, right? but low flying was all right. But the best flyer of the lot and those ones was Davy Rowcliffe, as I said before. He could fly it like a butterfly. And I remember one instance over a place called Nungaroo. Where but Nungaroo is on the West, uh, yeah, it's the eastern side of North Auckland, Nungaroo, and it's a sand dunes and that. We flew over this bunch of people, I think they were nudists, I think, <laughs> zoomed over the news. Oh, David did a split ass turn and we zoomed back again, you know, he got down behind the zoom, and snuck up over the top, we come up over the set, zoomed it down. And feeling them sitting in the back, and I look out here, we dodged over the ocean, there was three tracks in the water. Three tracks because the hawker hind had fixed undercart. There were two of the wheels, and the third one in the middle was a wash from the prop propeller. That's how close we were. It's low fly. <laughs> and we survived. <laughs> but he, he didn't lose control, is what I'm getting. That was a dicey one. <laughs>